Hello, my name is Benjamin Pietro Filardo from the North American Consortium for Responsible Ocean Mining. I'm going to be discussing briefly a method of extracting nodules using swarm robotics. Everybody at this conference is probably aware of the massive quantities of metals, such as nickel, copper, lithium, cobalt, and rare earth elements we're going to need if we want to decarbonize and electrify the future economy. The issues and the problems around land-based mining, I'm sure, are also well known to everybody here. A circular economy based on close to 100% recycling will not be possible, however, until a lot more of these metals are in circulation. If anybody hasn't seen it, Deep Green Metals has written an excellent white paper titled Where Should Metals for the Green Transformation Come From? and which makes this case very well and is an example of a company trying its best to be transparent while making a case for its business model, as well as making a case for its potential to have a significant positive environmental impact. There are three main types of seabed mineral resource that may be suitable for large-scale mining. Cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts on seamounts, massive sulfides at hydrothermal vents, and polymetallic nodules that are found in the deep-sea visible plains that cover much of the earth beneath our oceans. The mining of ferromanganese crusts requires pretty heavy machinery. There's going to be doing grinding, and there's going to be a lot of noise pollution uh, during that process. There's going to be a lot of debris thrown up into the water. And I think that there's an economic risk since any significant work being done by complex machinery at such a remote location, then the kinetic energy, such as grinding and crushing and so forth, uh, create a higher failure risk mechanically and therefore a higher economic risk. The environmental impacts of concern on the ferromanganese crusts are impacts on biodiversity. Biomass is greater than it is in the abyssal plains, which are mostly flat sediment. Any kind of mining of ferromanganese crusts has the potential to be pretty destructive in a number of ways. The massive sulfides associated with the hydrothermal vents occur where you have water that's been heated deep within the Earth's crust, so seeping up through cracks into the cold ocean water. Until the 1970s, it was assumed that sunlight through photosynthesis was the sole source of energy in the in Earth's biosphere. But at, at hydrothermal vents, there are bacteria that harvest energy from the chemicals in this heated water through chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. And these bacteria are the base of the food chain for a whole range of organisms living without any sunlight. And many of these organisms don't exist anywhere else. And it was the discovery of chemosynthetic ecosystems that led astrobiologists to start thinking about the potential for life in oceans beneath the ice of moons around other planets in our solar system. Of all the mining resources in the deep oceans, these perhaps need to be protected the most. The operational complexity of mining hydrothermal vents is also probably the greatest complexity among the three. There's a lot of manipulation of objects is required, a lot of procedures being carried out uh, that are fairly complex, increasing the risk of breakdown. So equipment failure risk is probably higher uh, and additional to the environmental concerns. The third category, the polymetallic nodules of the abyssal plains, are favored because of a combination of ease of collection and also the proposition that less environmental harm will be caused, in part because the biomass is so low down here, consisting mainly of bacteria, although it should be pointed out that the biodiversity is quite high. In other words, there are not many things living down here, but there are many different types of things living down here. So the NACROM proposition is that there are environmentally benign ways to retrieve these nodules from the abyssal plains, so that we can get the metals that we need without the destruction that people fear. And even if these fears are unfounded, these fears are going to potentially have a significant impact on commercial feasibility of these operations. And we think that not only can it be done environmentally benignly, but it can also be done in a way that's profitable and potentially more profitable than established methodologies under development. I'll start with a quick side-by-side -side comparison to point out the principal differences with the predominant nodule mining method on the left and the proposed NACROM method on the right. On the left you have one very large machine interacting with the nodules at the sea floor and on the right you have 
multiple small machines act interacting with the nodules on the seafloor. On the left, you have a single riser or conduit through which the nodules are pumped to the surface. And on the right side, the nodule trip to the surface is broken up into packets, so to speak. So on the left-hand side, you have one giant collector and one bottleneck to the surface. And on the right side, you have many collectors and no bottlenecks to the surface. With a conventional nodule mining method, the two main features are the trapped crawler and the pumped riser. The crawler moves across the seabed and lifts up the top few centimeters of sediment along with the nodules and anything else in its path. This all gets pumped to the surface and after the nodules are separated from everything that's been pumped to the surface, everything else has to be returned to the ocean at some location in the water column. And one of the environmental concerns raised is that the crawler kills everything in the top few centimeters of sediment. Another concern surrounds the plumes of sediment created by the lifting of nodules, the disturbance of the sediment, and the tracked crawler itself, or by the return of the effluent. So down here, most of the organisms are filter feeders, which could be smothered by the sediment as it settles back down, blocking the filter feeder's ability to feed. Concern has also been raised about the compaction of the sediment by the crawler's caterpillar tracks. The operational and therefore economic risk to this approach is that you have all your eggs in two very expensive baskets, one being the crawler and the other being the riser. If the crawler breaks down, the whole operation ceases. If the riser breaks down, the whole operation ceases. And these tracked crawlers are enormous, enormous machines, or they will be in their final versions. So if, for example, a, a single bolt is blown in the caterpillar track on the crawler, it will be very expensive, time-consuming, and risky to raise the crawler 5,000 meters back up to the surface. And there's only a limited number of repairs that can be performed on the seafloor using ROVs and so forth. So that's one economic concern. The other concern is the riser, which is a single, very narrow route through which the nodules can get to the surface. And if it breaks down, or it gets clogged, or there is some other kind of malfunction, then the whole operation, again, will cease. If the pumping unexpectedly stops, you've got essentially a five kilometer tall column of water and a pipe with nodules in it. And those nodules being heavier than water are going to descend down when the pumping ceases and they're going to settle in the lower part of the riser, for example. And I would think there are a lot of very complex technical issues such as this to be worked out to adapt a riser system developed for oil extraction into a nodule lifting mechanism. I know there's some really great work being done on this, and maybe all the technical issues have been solved at this point, but it's still an inherently risky proposition, we would say, to be relying on two singular pieces of equipment for the entire operation. Either one of them fails, production drops to zero. The NACRA methodology is more of a distributed system. That's one way of thinking about it. Beginning with the nodules, we have swarms of autonomous or semi-autonomous robots picking up nodules individually using a series of grippers, releasing them from the sediment with minimal disturbance of the sediment. And if a robot detects, for example, a megafauna growing on a nodule, it can leave that nodule untouched and tag its locations, so its presence is known to the swarm. It can photograph and upload an image to a database on the surface ship for the benefit of marine scientists and so on. These are not typical looking autonomous robots. These are plant energy systems robots that are under development at the moment. And I'm the founder and CEO of Plant Energy Systems. And I will mention briefly why we think our robots would be the ideal platform for this. But the essential concept is an intelligent robotic swarm that can efficiently harvest nodules without destroying the surface layer of the sediment while leaving some nodules behind that have life on them. There aren't a lot of nodules with megafauna on them, but when they are found, they can be left alone. Maybe a cluster of nodules can be left surrounding them. Maybe even, depending on how economically feasible we can make this, potentially every nodule that is picked up could be replaced with a low-value rock that was brought down as ballast, for example. These are some of the possibilities that present themselves with a method like this. So the robots do their harvesting. They drop the nodules into collection baskets, which when full are raised to the surface with a lift bag or a lifting vessel 
And so you have the constant lowering of empty nodule cages and the constant raising of full nodule cages. And this can be a 24 hour oper operation, a conveyor belt essentially of cages rising and cages falling, but cages that are not reliant on each other. If one cage runs into problems, the other cages will move around and past it and the operation can continue. So we have less noise pollution, less sediment disturbance, and you're interacting with the seafloor using a very unblunt instrument, so to speak. And we think that the net environmental impact of a system such as this could be very, very small. And even potentially, well, one can never say non-existent because we don't fully understand in general complex dynamic systems like ecosystems, but certainly the environmental case we think is pretty strong. The economic benefits are that we don't have to build the riser, which I understand is a very expensive capital expenditure, and we can build small and scale up. So you can start with a few robots, go through the multiple iterations of a piece of equipment that you can build on a workbench. Once the hardware and software has been integrated, the algorithms have been worked out for uh, swarming and so forth, then you can hit multiply. Robots at this scale can be built on an assembly line at low cost because they'll be mass produced hundreds or thousands at a time. And you can get economies of scale that can't be achieved when you're building essentially a handmade giant crawler. And the crawler won't allow you to go through the iterations at the rate uh, you can with a small vehicle. For example, you could test 10 different robot designs in a single mission, whereas it would take 10 missions to test 10 crawler designs or design variants. Doing away with the riser should also significantly lower the energy budget for the operation. Another potential cost saving with an obvious environmental benefit, especially if the operation is being powered by a carbon fuel burning generator on the surface ship. So with the pumped riser, you create a current of water in the riser to raise nodules that want to be sinking back down, fighting gravity all the way. If you're pumping oil, which is what these riser systems were originally designed to do, then 100% of what you're pumping is product. But in nodule mining, most of what you're pumping is seawater, so only a portion of your pumped volume is what you actually want. The rest is waste. Wasted energy carrying seawater to a great height above the ocean floor. You also have friction, turbulence being created, so the energy budget for pumping up these nodules three, four, five kilometers has to be pretty high. We think there can be a dramatically lower energy budget for raising the nodules to the surface using a, a retrieval system in which you just need enough energy uh, through pressure to become positively buoyant. And after that, it's an energy-free ride to the surface. So here is their side-by-side -side comparison again. Tracked crawler and pumped riser to the left, robot swarm and lifting vessel to the right. The obvious question is, are robots ready for this? Is this feasible technologically? And the answer, of course, in our opinion, is absolutely yes. Looking at some examples by others, there are, for instance, fruit picking robots that to operate in a cluttered 3D environment to identify and gently grip fruit without damaging it. Trash sorting robots using computer vision and AI sort out different materials for recycling, these technologies are advancing quite quickly. By comparison, nodule mining, nodule collecting is relatively easy. It admittedly, in this picture on the right, it's the ideal nodule field where they're right at the surface, close together, about the same size. But picking up metal objects on a 2D plane will be a relatively trivial task compared with identifying different types of trash and quickly picking them up and placing them in the right receptacle. Now depth is obviously a challenge, but there's nothing inherently more challenging with the NACROM approach or with plant energy systems robots. There's been a tremendous amount of development in, of autonomy in the driverless car world. The development also of robots that can pick up and stack boxes and so forth. So as marine roboticists, we believe that autonomy won't find its greatest value driving cars which we can do ourselves, or stacking boxes, which you can pay someone to do on a minimum wage much better. The place where autonomy will come into its own, we believe is performing tasks that people can't do easily or can't do as well. That said, a lot of the technology that has been developed for driverless cars, for example, 
is directly applicable to developing high uh, throughput data sensors and computer vision to process that data in real time and also the swarming technology with a large number of agents interacting with each other and behaving in a collective, a collective manner. This technology will be challenging to develop, but it's a technology within reach. It will take an incentive such as the potential profits from something like polymetallic nodule mining to push the world of autonomous robots to a level of functionality where the technology can be applied to other endeavors. On the left is a picture of a scallop troll rig. In the middle is an undisturbed scallop bed ecosystem. And on the right is a seafloor that's been decimated by scallop trolling, in this case, off the coast of Scotland. Now, if you can envisage a swarm of robots doing this job, lifting the scallops and leaving everything else untouched, essentially, leaving the ecosystem as it was, except with fewer scallops. And of course, the scallop population will recover more quickly because the ecosystem that supports it remains is also a benefit to the people whose livelihoods rely on scallops. This method can in principle be applied to the harvest of other shellfish such as mussels, crabs and so forth. Once we have this technology matured through seabed mining we'll be able to apply to some very big environmental and ecological problems such as the replanting of seagrass which in most of the world is already gone. The efforts to restore it today are valiant, but it needs to be done on a truly massive scale. We need to replant thousands of square miles of seagrass in coastal waters around the world. We need to do it for the carbon sequestration that it provides, since seagrass beds that can store huge quantities of carbon dioxide in the sediment below them. We need to do it for coastal erosion prevention. Seagrass beds are tremendously rich ecosystems with a high biomass and which are spawning grounds for commercial and sports fish, for example. Some of what seagrass provides for coastal environments is important to oceanic health in general. And the technology can be applied, for example, to coral reef restoration and planting. It's being done now by volunteer snorkelers at the weekends, uh, after school programs for teenagers and so forth, which is great but it's not going to be enough. We need to be thinking in terms of millions of hectares, and that's a job for a swarm of robots. Uh, it's just not a feasible task for an army of humans, each needing a living wage, meals, sleep, scuba equipment, and always at risk of drowning in some freak accident. So where does my company, Plant Energy Systems, as distinct from the organization of NACROM, which I represent, where does Plant Energy Systems fit into this? Now, we've been developing what we consider to be the ideal robot for an endeavor like, such as this. And it's an absolutely novel platform um, with high agility, high efficiency. It creates low perturbation of the water it moves through. And if you want to learn more about our platform, our website is plantenergy.com. So here's some footage of a prototype Plant Energy Systems robot. You see it's quite different from anything else around. It has a very high static thrust per watt, which means higher swimming efficiency uh, for more, work, more nodules collected per battery charge. So good for rapid local maneuverability, which I think you would want for scouting, performing multiple rapid movements at a local level. It can turn quickly, it can move straight up and straight down. It's also amphibious and it's also a very good ice skater, but that's not really relevant here, so we can skip that. So that concludes my presentation. Here is the NACROM website. If you want to learn more, feel free to get in touch via info at nacrom.org. Thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of the conference.